that's been a couple rough weeks. We took our vacation on them because we knew that we went on vacation in a while. But on the way over there, our truck um, left us stranded in the middle of nowhere. So um, it's a pretty new truck. You know, it's 29,000 miles and it broke down on us. So. so we don't have a car. And our, our truck is being fixed in Marshall, like two and a half hours away from here. And uh, the thing is that, you know, they still looking into it and we don't even have a car. They don't have to give us a rental. So it's a mess. But on Thursday, there was this, I, was, I was working and one of my clients comes up to me, he's like, man, I have a hot deal for you right now. And I was like, what, what, what time? I said, give me $200 and this car is yours right here. And I, and I look at it, it was a Honda, it's just a Honda. And I was like, and the first thing he asked, well, what's wrong with it? He said, nothing's wrong with it. You just need oil change and spark plugs. And I was like, well, I'll give you a thousand and I'm taking a gamble here. It's all done. And you're still hustling me. I told him right there. He's like, all right, just give me a thousand and the car's yours. So later on, we were doing the paperwork and he's like, and then we explained to him what happened to us with our car and everything. We couldn't have a car. And my father in law was living in part of his car. And then he said, man, I'm glad I asked you. I didn't know you needed a car. But he, he's like, but that's how God works. And so, amen. So, praise to God because, you know, he's always you know, he's looking out for us. So, we didn't have a car. And then this my client of mine just came up to me and offered me his car. He says he didn't need it because he has too many cars. So, praise God. So, um, God is good. So, let's open up our Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 12. And it says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer. Let's, uh, let's bow down our heads and, and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord, that you have given us here to be here once again, Lord, to praise your name, to worship you, Lord. I ask, Lord, in this morning that you speak to us, that you speak to our hearts, that you speak to our minds, Lord, that the word that you have for us, Lord, may encourage us to keep on praising you and worshiping your name, Lord. That you speak to any all of us, Lord, that you swore to speak to I ask you, Lord, that you use your servant and you speak your word with boldness and power. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You guys can take your seats. So just before I start preaching, I want to encourage you guys and, you know, to praise God. So that's you know, the title of my, of my preaching this morning. Praise your way out. So... I just want to say that on Tuesday, uh, we'll be having our Tuesday talks with all of our young men and women. So I encourage you guys and invite you guys to all of you guys that are not joining us to join us because we have a, a great time to hear the Word of God and then we also play games. So our Tuesday talks, uh, and then uh, we hear the Word of God. And this Tuesday, Brother Caleb brought us a word that was a powerful word. So I encourage you guys that are not joining us to join us. So that being said, so. The title for this morning is Praise Your Way Out. And I know the, the Roman, the, the chapter, the, the verse that we just read, it says rejoice in hope. And that's mostly what I'm going to focus in. So I don't know if you guys have, any, have heard over the years, I have heard this, that we have, you know, we hear a lot of um, Christians or brothers, and, you know, when they ask them, you know, if they ask them, I ask them, if, if you have a question to ask God, what would it be? And they, you know, there's a study that says all of them would ask, well, most of them, like 70% would ask, why do the Christians suffer? And we also have encountered people that say that, you know, why do Christians suffer? Because many think that God is supposed to protect us from trials, right? They say, well, I just don't understand why I'm going through these trials. I read the Bible, I go to church, I pray, I fast, and I try to do the best and try to get closer to God the best I can. Why is he allowing these things to happen to me? You know, maybe we have asked that, or maybe we're going through that and asking that right now. So the expectation is that following the Lord, or following Jesus is supposed to accept us from trials. We're supposed to be immune from that. But I don't know what version of the Bible these brothers or sisters are reading, because the Bible that I read that I've been reading for years from cover to cover, it states and says clearly that godly people will suffer intense trials. Look at Job. He was the most righteous man during his time, during his time on earth. And look what happened. Look at all he suffered. You look at King David, you know, before he was a king. You know, he was a man after God's own heart. 
and yet he spent most of his 20s running away from the king, running away from for his life. You look at Daniel, he was a faithful prophet, he was a, a godly prophet, a man of prayer, and yet he was thrown in the lion's den as an old man. And there are many examples in the Old Testament that many people uh, suffer terrible things. And when you come to the New Testament, Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born. And yet he was thrown into prison because he confronted the king of his sin. And you already look at it, Jesus himself. He was the sinless son of God who was about doing everything for everybody. And look at what he suffered. If the Lord suffered that horribly, you know, why should we think that we would be exempt from that? I mean, he was a perfect man. He suffered. What makes us think that we can't suffer? Especially since the Bible tells us that we are supposed to expect suffering. Jesus plainly said to his disciples in Matthew 20, 49, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. See, the Bible never promises those who follow Christ would have a trouble. I mean, a life free of trouble. And then we come to the Apostle Paul, who was one of the boldest, most faithful witnesses to Christ, one of the most hardworking apostles, and one of the most influential apostles in the New Testament. And yet, he was thrown in prison, he was false, he had false accusations, he was beating, he had imprisonments, and he was uh, shipwrecked three times, and, you know, and much more. And he, he says that in 2 Corinthians 11, 23. He speaks of what he has suffered. And then he, when he was thrown in jail, he was left by himself. But look what he says to the, to, to the believers. He says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to go through tribulations. That's what he's saying. So, as Christians, sometimes we ask the question, why are we going through this? Why are we supposed, why are we suffering these things. Like I said, you know, I was going, you know, I had plans. I had been a great weekend. And we had plans that by noon, you know, we left Friday morning. By noon, I was supposed to get to Grand Canyon. Well, it was, it was 8 in the morning, a truck broke down. They come to pick us up at 11. So we were sitting in the road, in 120 degree weather, waiting for the, the tow truck to, to come pick us up. Things happen. And, and things like that happen to Christians. And, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but when you're in the middle of nowhere, you know, you, you know it's, 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 it's scary. But what, what, what Paul's saying is that we must go through tribulations. I mean, if you read the book of Romans, uh, at the beginning of the book of Romans, he tells the, 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 the Romans that he wants to go visit them. He says, for I long to see you. Paul had decided to visit Rome, but it wasn't in God's plans for him to visit Rome yet. He wanted to go visit Rome. He wanted to go preach the word. But God didn't have that in his plans yet. But Paul could have said, Lord, I want to go to Rome. I, I'm going to preach the word. What's so bad about me going to Rome and preach the word of God? But it wasn't in God's plans yet. Let me tell you something. Just because we are doing godly things doesn't mean we're doing the will of God. Now, it, it seems that a lot of times we, we want to do the things of God, but sometimes it's not in God's plans to do something yet. He wants us to wait, and that's why he wanted, he wanted Paul to wait before he went to Rome. God had the plans for him to visit Rome, and when he finally appeared, and he finally arrived at the capital of the world in Rome, which was that time, it wasn't in the condition that Paul was expecting. Paul arrived to Rome in chains. He arrived as a prisoner. He had sent Paul to preach the word of God in chains. Paul was preaching about freedom when he was a prisoner. He was, he was, he was sent to break the chains of many while he was in chains. He was, he was sent to break the shackles while he was in shackles. Maybe Paul thought, I came to bring freedom to the city but the one that needs freedom is myself. The one that needs to be set free is me. But he never said that. Paul encouraged people 
And that's why when he was in prison in Rome, he wrote the book of Philippians, Ephesians, and all you see there is encouragement. And sometimes we're in difficult situations and we're going through tribulations and we hear the word and God is telling us to preach the word and he's telling us to preach about hope when we feel hopeless. Sometimes the God, God tells us to preach about healing when we need healing ourselves. Sometimes God tells us to preach about joy when we need joy for ourselves. We say, God, well, let me get my joy first and then I can preach about that. Let me take care of these problems and then I'll praise you. Let me fight this battle, then I can praise you. But let me tell you guys something. Praise God instead of fighting the battle. See, the reason why we fight battles and we don't overcome and we don't win battles is because we're fighting battles that we're not supposed to. Battles that don't belong to us. Instead of fighting the battles, you're supposed to be praising God. Because those battles are not your battles. So why are you fighting a battle that you can't win? Instead of fighting it, just praise God. See, there's, there's a story in the, the, the book of Chronicles, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There's a story about the king, King Jehoshaphat. That there was three nations coming against him, and um, he felt hopeless. But one thing he did is that he went and prayed to God, and then he received the word that says, "Don't fight this fight battle because this battle belongs to me." So what the king did is he obeyed God, and he didn't fight the battle. What he did is that he praised God. See, when the pray, when the battle, when the problems get bigger, our worship needs to get louder. When the enemy brings more tribulations, we need to elevate our worship. See, Paul and Silas were in prison, but they didn't stay there and they stayed quiet. They opened up their mouth and started worshiping God because the Bible says that every prisoner in there would hear what they were praising. So when the battle comes to you bigger and stronger, you gotta elevate your, your, your praise. You gotta elevate your worship. Because that's how we praise our way out. But the thing is that the truth is that a lot of us, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of it, are accustomed to worship in one place. And I'm not talking about church, I'm not talking about century, is that we're accustomed to worship in one place, and that place is the after. We're only accustomed to praise God after the miracle. We're only accustomed to praise God and worship God after we receive a blessing. See, but this king didn't do that. This king started worshiping God before the battle, started worshiping God during the battle and after the battle. See, that's what we gotta do. We can't just worship God after the battle. We gotta change our places where we worship God. Before the battle, during the battle, and after the battle. Because sometimes we just praise God because we got what we wanted. No, we're just glad that we got what we wanted, and that's why we pressure God. And that's the only place we worship, it's in the after, after the miracle. But God's looking for men and young women that would love them, but show true love that they would worship God during and before the battle. See, God's looking for people that were going to worship Him and say, Lord, it doesn't matter the outcome of the situation, it doesn't matter if I come out with a blessed heart or not, I'm still going to worship you. Before, I'm still going to worship you. During the battle, I'm going to worship you. And it doesn't matter the outcome, I'm still going to worship you. That's what God is looking for. True worshipers that will worship it. doesn't matter the circumstances. doesn't matter the situation. Victory or not, you will still receive my praise. But, we got to praise God even if our, our plans go down the drain. Because we have plans, and many, many times our plans don't come out the way we want to. Like I just explained to you guys what, what happened to me, but uh, when we drop off the, you know, the, the tow truck picked us up and dropped us to the leadership, and then we went on our way, they, they gave us a rental, and we went to our vacation and we stayed there three days, but when we came back Monday, we were expecting some good news or something from, from the leadership or from our truck. What they ended up telling us is that they can't fix the truck till the 21st of August 
And then they can't give us a rental, so they start working on it. So we said, what are we going to do in the meantime without a car? Now, remember, we're in Barstow, middle of nowhere. We wanted to come back home already, and there's no rentals. We called every rental place that there is. They, rent, they don't have cars. There's no rentals. So we, we get a ticket for the Greyhound. And uh, it's, this is three three o'clock on Monday, and the the Greyhound doesn't leave the place till seven, and we're like three miles away from it. So we get a um, we, there's no there's no cars and like I don't know, for some reason the Uber app wasn't working. So we had to walk there three miles. It was like 120 degree weather, and all we were saying was complaining. Complaining was that like, why do people live here? How do people live here? Like, it's 120 degree weather. Like, it's so hot. They can't even walk us. And all I was doing was complaining. And sometimes that's what we do. That's all we know how to do: complain and complain and complain. But the truth is that we got to worship God because I said, you know what? It could be, it could be worse. You no, know, it could be worse. But you know, it's you know. Finally, my brother gets out of work. He's like, you know what? I'll go pick you up. You know, you don't have to take the train because the train is at seven, and we're gonna be in home till like one in the morning. So I praise God that no, He kept us safe during all those times because we thought it was a vacation, but it kind of turned into like a nightmare. But you know, I praise God that He's always with us. But but we gotta we gotta worship God even if our plans go down the drain because sometimes we have plans or God gives us gives us plans. And we expect it to work right there in the moment. God told David that he was going to be king. And it didn't happen right away, right? But see, David, didn't, that didn't change the situation of, of David's worship. David would worship God anywhere, anytime. It didn't matter what the situation was. Because there was a young shepherd with nothing. And he would praise God. He went from a shepherd to being anointed as king, and he still praised God. He went from anointed king to be exiled, running away from his life, running and hiding in caves, and he still praised God in those caves. And finally, he became a king, and he praised God. So David would praise God, it doesn't matter where, if it was after, before, or during the situation, he would praise God. He would be a runaway, an exile, and he would still be praising God. He was, he was a king with everything in his hand. And he still praised God. He didn't just praise God for what was in his hand. He didn't praise God for what he could give him. He praised God for who he was. That's what God is looking for. Young men and women that will praise God in all places. Not after the blessing. When my, when my wife was pregnant with my, with my son, um, I don't know if I told you guys this, but one day the doctor called her and told her to go because they didn't do a checkup, but my wife said, I just did one last week. She said, no, you need to come and come right now. So she goes and the doctor does an ultrasound and tells her, do you see this part? And she's like, yeah, I see it. The doctor says, your, your son is going to have heart problems. So you can either abort or have them. So my wife calls me, you know, this was early morning, it was a Wednesday early morning. She tells me, hey, this is what the doctor told me. And uh, I told, don't tell anybody because I don't want your, your mom or my parents to get, you know, to, to get scared or anything like that. So let's just, you know, keep it to, to us and we're going to pray God and he's going to do the miracle. So this was early in the morning. So when I received the call, the first thing that I did is that, uh, I praise God, and the same day, I, I said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not. I offer you this fasting today. So, all day I was, you know, just thinking about God and His goodness. And then that night, I went to sleep. And I, I got a dream or a vision, and I 
I remember seeing my son at the age he is right now. At the same age he is. And I saw him sitting in the, 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 the benches and I saw him smile. But I saw his face. It was if I was seeing a picture. So I saw exactly how he would look. No, I saw his hair, his face, the way you guys see him right now. That's the way I saw him in my dream. So I wake up and I praise God and I say, Lord, thank you for the miracle. Because I'm a, I saw my son walking and running around. And I saw the same exact face that I'm seeing at the stage that he's at, at three years old. I saw his hair color and his eyes. And when I woke up, I said, God, thank you for the miracle you have. And, and I also said, you know, he just looks like a he looks just stuck in it. I know that we have fine so. But that's where we gotta be stuck. Before and during the battles. Because it's easy to worship God after the blessing. It's easy to worship God to praise Him after everything's calm and we receive the victory. But God wants us to praise Him and worship Him before and during the battle. Because that shows us that these things in this world, these material things, it doesn't matter to us. What matters is that we love Him and He loves Him. That our number one is Him. Because all the praise and all the worship goes to Him. Because as human beings, we want attention for ourselves. And sometimes we want praise for ourselves. You know, I, I see it in my son, you know, since we're, they're little kids, they want attention. If I'm doing something, writing a text message, or reading the Bible, or I'm busy, all I hear is saying, Papa Mira, Papa Mira. And I hold on and say, Papa Mira. And I look, and all he does is the little jump. And I look at him and say, It's not that impressive. But my wife says to me, He just wants you to feel proud of him. So I go and say, Wow, he said, That's great. And like five minutes later, again. But that's how kids are. You know, they want attention. And when they grow older, when they go to school, which, by the way, he's going to go to school tomorrow, his first day, but when they bring something from school, they want you to put it in the fridge because they think it's a masterpiece. They, say, they think it's something great. And sometimes that's how we are with God. We say, look, look, God, look what I did today. I prayed a little bit longer today. Oh, look, God, I fasted today. You can put that up in the fridge. Or sometimes we say, look, God, I talked to this person about God. Or, look, Lord, today I prayed in front of people for my food. But God is saying, that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. And sometimes that's 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 how we, we, we want attention, right? Because we sometimes move ourselves, get a haircut because we want to hear compliments. But the truth is that some people use the power of God, the name of God, for their own glory. And there's a story in the Bible about Simon. You know, when when Peter, not Simon Peter, but when Peter was preaching the word and he started praying for the, for the brothers that got baptized and received the Holy Spirit. And Simon was a sorcerer. And he said, I'll give you money so you can give me that power. But Peter tells him, your money and you perish because you think that you can buy the gift of God with money. The thing is that this Simon was a sorcerer. People would compare him to God and they would call him God and he was very famous. So he thought that using the name of God and the power of God would make him even more famous. Because he wanted the praise and glory for himself. But I love the Psalms that says 1, 115 says, Not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but to your name be your glory. See, the psalmist starts rejecting all glory when he starts writing the psalm. He says, I don't want no glory, I don't want no praise, because everything is, belongs to you. 
So Paul, even, even though Paul was in shackles, even though Paul was in, in, in the prison, even though he was in chains when he arrived to Rome, he said, if I can bring worship, if I can bring praise to God in this chains, I'm going to do it. If I, can, if I can bring and expand the kingdom of God in this chains, I'm going to do it. Not for my glory, not for my praise, but for the name of the Lord. So if we can bring praise to God in the middle of the situation, it's for His glory and for His honor. Because be careful when you try to say the praise that belongs to God. Be careful when you let something else take His place. Don't let another idol take the place that belongs to God. So you destroy that idol before it destroys you. Because look, we were created to be worshipped, right? And I don't take a little bit long, but I'm just finish right here. We were created to worship. And if we're not worshiping God, we're worshiping something else. It's the truth. People say, I don't worship anything. No, no. You worship something. If you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something else. It can be the government, it can be money, and it can be yourself. You're worshiping yourself. So look how great I am, how what the accomplishment I have. So we were created to worship. So something at one point of our lives, we're worshiping something. So sometimes God, you know, allows bad things or difficult times in our situations for, for Him just to try to let us know to wake up that we place something above Him. Because He's jealous. And he, he, he wants our worship. So when something happens, this guy's telling us, hey, you replace me with that. I want you to come back and give that worship to me. Yeah. I don't worship, I don't want you worshiping that, those idols. Bring that worship back to me. That's what God sometimes allows us to have those things because he wants that worship for him. And I'm going I'm to ask you guys to stand up. And on Tuesday, we, 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 we were at uh, our Bible study, and we started singing. And when we started singing that, the song, which is a song that I really love, the heart of worship, you know, it's telling us to bring the worship to Him. Because sometimes we make it about us, sometimes we make it about something else. And that's why I love the sense says, I'm sorry for the things that I made when it's all about you, Jesus. 